Welcome to the In Story Show. I'm Devorah Spillman, your host, and today I am thrilled to welcome In Story expert Nancy McCoy. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Devorah. So, Nancy is an artist, a shaman, and a mentor, and she's part of the In Story Way, and she does a lot of work with people to help them find their most divine essence and their biggest possibilities and bring them out in the world, and we are going to dive into that here. But before we do, like with everybody, I love for you to start with a little bit about what you were like when you were a kid. <laughs> what was I like when I was a kid? I lived so far out in the country, you could not even believe it. <laughs> um, my father was a mink rancher, and my mother worked on the mink ranch as well. And so because of that, uh, we had to live a long ways away from people. And we had to live in a place where it got very cold in the winter. So I grew up in Wisconsin where winters are, wow, winter. <laughs> but the beauty of that was, besides my brother and my sister, I had nature. It was all around me. And when we were really young, we got to be outside a lot. And I had a pony, I had a dog. Um, I got to be playing outside most of the time. My little brother and I did it a lot together. And I was alone by myself uh, a lot outside with my dog, my best friend. So, okay, so tell us a little bit about this kind of crazy flooding the house turning point story. Um, because these kind of stories really affect us more than we realize. Okay. Um, I didn't realize that the flooding the house was a traumatic story until I was in my 30s. To me, it was, it was always a funny story about when my brother and I were little and we woke up from a nap and we decided to give the teddy bears a bath. And before you know it, we had water all over the house and we had taken every dry thing in the house and it was flowing around the house. And my parents who worked, it was in the winter time, it was the hardest time for them. They, were, they worked sun up to sundown um, because that's when you kill the mink, you skin them because that's when the fur is the greatest. And that was the busiest time because the, um, they took them to market around Christmas time. And so they were working and they came in the house and all this, and my mother absolutely lost it. She was exhausted. Uh, and um, my little brother and I paid dearly for that time. Um, but really, we always talked about it as a funny story, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't. It was the thing that really changed my life, um, kind of shut me down as to who I really was. I didn't think I had logic from that point on for a long time. I didn't think that, I didn't think I could make a choice. I didn't think I could make a decision. I didn't think I could look at things and weigh them and uh, know one way or another. Um, and I was only five <laughs> when it happened. <laughs> right. I mean, it's amazing. That's why I so often ask people to share their stories because it's, it's kind of amazing, both how naturally amazing and free we kind of start out and how we get shut down. So, so keep going. What did you do once you left home? Well, when I left home, um, I, was, I was 17. I just had turned 18 years old. And I left home within a year. I was married and I was having babies. I had two children by the time I was 21 years old. I was divorced at 24. I was a single mother at 24 years old. Didn't go to college. My parents were, neither one of them, I don't think, ever graduated from high school. Uh, my father was self-educated. He read the Encyclopedia Britannica front to back. And my mother was a child of Polish immigrants, and so she couldn't speak English when she went to school. So no one pushed me to go to college, even though I think I probably could have gotten scholarship and things like that. But when I got sick, uh, my life really changed. Um, I got hepatitis a couple of years later uh, from a boyfriend uh, who had it and didn't tell me. <laughs> 
that he had it. And um, so I was given a choice. I could either stay in the hospital for uh, a month, which I had no insurance. How could I do that? <laughs> or I could stay home and take really good care of myself. So I had to send my kids away. And um, my parents brought groceries and left them on the porch because at that time they didn't know that there were different kinds of hepatitis. The kind I had was hepatitis B, serum hepatitis that um, my boyfriend had gotten before I ever met him from doing drugs with needles. Thing I did not have any clue about. I was so naive. I was such a naive young woman. So spending uh, 30 days alone really causes, it caused my mind to kind of burrow in on itself. And I was kind of terrified of everything. <laughs> I didn't know what was, I didn't know what was real and what wasn't. And I read the Bible at that time because I was afraid to do anything else. <laughs> and um, I was in great need of help. And there was no one there to help me. There was no one. I wasn't in contact with anyone. Wow. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So one night after I'd been alone for actually almost two months, because I wasn't feeling any better, um, I was up all night. And I was, I guess you could call it screaming for help inside. And I guess you could call it prayer outside. I was asking some, please help me, please help me. And I, that was when I realized that there was something beyond what we can see and feel and touch. Because first I opened the window and the drapes were billowing and it was, it was, it was the middle of the night. It was probably two, three o'clock in the morning because I didn't know the difference between day and night at that time. <laughs> and um, I had a presence come and join me. And I pulled out my drawing tools because I'd always drawn my whole life. And what I drew was Jesus Christ or what I thought of as Jesus Christ. But he didn't have eyes. What he had was, they were like plus signs. They were not the cross. They were like plus signs, which I learned later was the four directions in Native American spirituality. So Jesus Christ came just to know, for me to know that I was not alone. The second presence that entered was my grandmother, mm. who had died when I was eight years old, and I didn't really know her. But I knew it was her. And we wrote and we drew together. I drew mandalas trying to find my way out of this place that I was in that was physical, it was emotional, it was mental, and it was spiritual crisis. It was to, I was in crisis. And my grandmother was there and she helped me get out of it. She helped me find my way out. And I drew and I wrote my way out of it. And the next morning, I knew what I had to do. I called my ex-husband and I said, send the kids home. <laughs> and I put my house up for sale and I went to live with my uncle in West Virginia and I went to college. And I took drawing, drawing classes and I started my, my art at that point. And so where did that lead you? Well, it led me to actually, um, when I, I, I was in West Virginia with my uncle, and I can tell you that the mountains of West Virginia are beautiful. Um, the people of West Virginia are not the people of Colorado, which is where I grew up. <laughs> they are not the people of, from Colorado. And, and all I could think of, Devorah, was I had to get back to Colorado. My uncle actually wanted to put me through art school. He knew that I had talent. 
and he wanted to put me through art school, but all I could think about was getting back to Colorado. So my kids and I came back to Colorado and I, f I found the most beautiful place in the state. And I've kind of been here ever since. I've lived for a while in Grand Junction, Colorado, but I live in Crested Butte, Colorado. And it is probably the most beautiful place in this state. And so I was a single mother and I worked two jobs and I had two children who also never had anyone take care of them. They were seven and eight years old when we moved to uh, Crested Butte, but everybody in the apartment building knew my kids. My kids could knock on anyone's door. They could call me on the phone, but I worked all the time. I worked, work was the easy part, <laughs> but I was still on a quest to understand what had happened to me and how to make sense out of what I can't see and touch. I was not blessed being able to see angels all the time and things like that. But I knew that there was a life beyond this, this physical reality. And I was determined to find spirit. <laughs> I was determined. Well, so what are some of the things, what are a couple of things that really allowed you to do that? Because I think a lot of people have that feeling. I know there's more, but what am I supposed to do about it? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I guess that that was a really, that was really stressful for me. That was really stressful for me working and not still not understanding, but knowing and that sort of thing. Um, in, in the eighties, I lived in Grand Junction and I learned a ton of healing modalities. One of the first things I learned was transcendental meditation. What that allowed me to do, Devorah, was transcendental meditation is designed to release stress. So uh, twice a day, my stress was, I was letting my stress go, which helped me to see clear, more clearly. I, I, could, I was able to think more clearly. I was able to be a better mother. I was able to be clearer on what life was. So then I started learning healing modalities, things like educational kinesiology. I did rebirthing. I did, um, I, I learned dowsing. I learned all these different things, but every one of them helped me heal inside. Just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And um, my kids graduated from school, from high school. And I'm like, hmm, what is it that I want to do now? So I went to the University of Colorado and I took painting classes. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so my art was coming forth at that, that point a little bit. And in 1989, just before I went to go to art school, I went to Jamie Sam's Native American Spiritual Healing Workshop where I got my medicine name, which became a calling. And so now I had a basis for understanding. I had some frame of reference to who I really was, why nature was so important. That's what Native American spirituality is all about. We are all one. We are all divine. We are all part of this earth, this living being, and um, great spirit, um, the universe, oneness, God works through us. And that became how I understood life. That was what happened. And in 1999, I went to Egypt <laughs> with an author, Greg Braden, who is also a scientist. And I adore Greg because he takes science and he melds it with ancient spiritual knowledge. And what I've learned is that all, all spiritual practices have value. All of them do. And that you can be Christian, or you can be Jewish, or you can be Muslim, or you can be Sikh, or, you know, Buddhist. Buddhism is not really a religion. And you can understand that 
spirit moves in our lives. Every day, spirit moves in our lives. And so that was of great value. So when I went to Egypt, I saw things and I learned that I really was a healer. I was told by a being that I saw with my own two eyes and who wasn't really there. <laughs> she disappeared immediately. <laughs> told me that I was a healer. But it was because I was resisting that idea and I was in Egypt and oh my God, magical things happen in Egypt. So yeah, and, I, and that was when I really started knowing that there was magic and that magic is the ability to change ourselves in a very rapid and real way. Um, and magic happens all the time uh, for me now. Um, so then in the 2000s, right after that happened, I studied shamanism and um, I've been on that path along with all my other, I'm, I'm just a seeker. I'm a spiritual adventurer. <laughs> That's what I call myself now. Um, so, um, and I was with somebody then. I, I, I was with, I worked, I still worked. I did everything that I did, but my spiritual life was the most important thing to me. So this would be a really good time, I think, for you to give us a little taste of some of, I know you have a big process that you're going to give everybody a super cool thing, but you, there's a little process that I would love for you to lead us through just to get a little bit of a taste of what all of this has given to you. You know, I know it's so much your passion to help everybody get to, to really trust this higher wisdom, this higher guidance, this divine connection, this oneness we all have. So are you game to lead us through? Um, yes. Process? I, just, I just want everybody to know that this is not mine. This is not something I created. This is something that I believe very strongly in. Uh, it came uh, through a spirit called Sri Yukteswar, who was the teacher of Yogananda to a gentleman named uh, Drunvalo Mekizadek, who uh, does the flower life sacred geometry kind of work. Um, but what it will do is help you understand um, who we really are. So just everybody close your eyes. And just breathe. And as you're breathing, allow your awareness to go to a place where you feel is the most beautiful place on this planet. Where on Mother Earth is the most beautiful place for you? And see it as fully as you can. Are there trees? Is it the desert? Is it the mountains? Is it the ocean? If it's the ocean, hear the waves. If it's the mountains, are there birds? Are there deer? Can you hear the creek, the, the water running down a stream? Feel it as fully as you can. Know that you love that place on Mother Earth. So feel the love. Feel the love that you feel every time you go there, every time you think of it. Keep building that love inside. Your love for Mother Earth. Your love for this planet that's given us everything through that very special place that you love. 
Feel that love building in your heart. And now take that love, see yourself placing it in a sphere and sending it down straight into the center of Mother Earth, the Divine Mother. And holding on to that feeling of love of the mother. She'll come back to you. She'll send her love back to you. You might hear something. You might feel it. You might see something. It may be a message. Just take it in, whatever, whatever Mother Earth is giving you. Take it in and let it, let it go through your entire body. Your gift from the Divine Mother, as you have gifted her with your love, she gifts you back with hers. Feel it all around you and within you. And while feeling that feeling of the Divine Mother's love inside you, think about the Heavenly Father, the Divine Father, all of creation outside of this earth, the heavens, the moon, the sun, the stars, the nebula, place where stars are born. What is some special, special thing for you? Is it the last crescent moon? Is it the sun? Is it a special nebula? Now that we have all the telescopes, all the amazing pictures coming back from space, what is one that's really struck you as absolutely amazing, divine? And focus your love and attention on that. The divine father, all of creation outside of earth. And let your love build. More. And when you're ready, you can put that love in a sphere and send it out to the Divine Father, creation, the heavens. and wait until it comes back. The love of the Divine Father coming back to you. Again, it could be a vision, could be words, whatever it is. Accept it into your being. And now something rare has happened. The connection of Divine Mother and Divine Father in your heart, you, the Divine Child, the Divine Trinity is alive. And now you know that this is where you can know God. 
So just feel that you are alive with your divine mother and your divine father as the divine child. And as a divine child, your divine parents would want you to have anything and what is it that you want? Let it be known at this time. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Hmm. It's always one of the challenging parts of having someone you interview lead you through a deep, expansive, guided process. You have to come back and finish your interview. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Oh. Yeah. And you can do this anytime you want. They call it the unity breath. This is the unity breath. Um, it is not mine, but it is a way that all of us can know that we are part of the divinity of love. So, so it feels so healing just right? to, <laughs> oh my gosh, to just feel the, that love in such a simple yet profound way because like this just is what our reality is we have this earth we have these heavens we have this body like it's made me feel so oh it's like this feeling of being loved and illuminated at the same time right i know i know it's such a beautiful little process it was first it was introduced to me by my shaman yeah <laughs> So beautiful. So, you know, I always encourage people, we would love for you to share your experience from this process, whatever part feels, you know, safe or comfortable to share in the Facebook group, because, you know, a lot of my mission with this is for us to come out of hiding, is to dare to be seen. And part of what we want to show is this true part of us, this beautiful, loving, shiny, real part, the part we had to shut down. That part that was before the shutdown, it's like I always say, you get to have it back. And, you know, it's a big part of in story. And I know, Nancy, you can talk if you want a little bit about just this passion to share what it's, how in stories helped you share more of this, because we want people to trust that deep inner calling of your souls, because the world needs to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. For me, um, first of all, this process is one that I believe everyone, if you're afraid to ask, if you're afraid that you're good enough to ask, just become the divine child for a few minutes and you understand your worthiness. So um, yeah. moving on to in-story, I joined in-story um, because I want to write, I want to tell some of my stories. But what I found when I joined in story was that the real reason I was there <laughs> was, um, I, I don't know if it's a, so I wish you could call it so much a companionship. Um, it's a connection. It's a really uh, innocent and uh, loving connection to other women who are all on different points of their journey of trying to be their best selves. Uh, so I'm not in a position where I'm teaching or I'm healing. Um, I can just be my not so perfect self. <laughs> And the people of In Story are very supportive and kind, and I'm connected to them in a way that I haven't been for a very long time because I've walked this journey really alone, even though I, I had a, a partner uh, until a year and a half ago. 
And he was a great partner in that he let me love him just the way he was. And being able to give your love is really a gift for me. And so, um, but he wasn't, he wasn't involved in my, my quest for myself. Mm -hmm. And all the women who, all the people who are in end story um, are at different places in that journey themselves. And we get to support each other in just crazy, funny ways with our wacky leader, Devorah. <laughs> and I get to be my wacky self sometimes too, because yeah, I get, I get so excited sometimes I can't stand myself. So yeah, thanks, Devorah. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> yes, I know it's true. I tell everybody I'm deep in a little wacky and I'm proud of it. So, <laughs> and that's part of my vision is that we let that creative, deep in a little wacky means spiritual and creative in regular language. It's like we let that part out. Um, you know, and Nancy, it's important to say that your your partner passed away, you know, that being being in that widowed state of being is is really a, another one of those very hard turning points because didn't a, a lot of what you do, it, it, an aspect of what you do began after that, right? Um, yeah. Um, well, I've been, I started shaman school in uh, 2003 and um, I have been on this path. I have been doing personal healings for people um, since then, uh, along with running a business, we had a business, we were building a house, we had horses, we had cats, we had a whole life, but I was doing this as well because it's something that I have to do. My spirit requires it of me. When my husband died um, about a year and, I don't know, eight months ago, um, after a two year illness, um, while there was grief, I realized that I did a lot of my grieving while he was ill. I knew he was leaving. There was no doubt that he was leaving. So I did a lot of my grieving then. So 10 days after he passed, I was in Peru with my teacher from shaman school doing sacred plant medicines, ayahuasca. Um, and I have been traveling a lot ever since. Um, and my husband doesn't come to me in spirit, but he comes to other people <laughs> in dreams or in spirit, you know, and you know, people will call me up and say, hi, Mike came and talked to me last night and this is what he wanted me to tell you. So it's really beautiful. And he knows that I would probably discount it. I would say, oh, that wasn't really what happened but when other people tell you these things it's kind of hard not to and he's happy and he's happy that i'm happy um and so the while the grief sometimes comes it's not it's not a hurt it's not a pain and i believe that um i, I always say that he had two gifts for me sharing his life with me and his death mm. because now I am free I'm retired um, and I get to go wherever I want to go and do pretty much whatever I want to do pretty much whenever I want to do it so <laughs> I've been I'm, I'm in two and a half weeks I'm on my way to Peru for my sixth trip in um, a year and eight months and um, yeah, I, I, the sacred plant medicine is really a different aspect that I never dreamed of. And I, I found that it helps a lot of people my age. I actually read an article in the New York Times recently that was about older people finding happiness through help from doing sacred plant medicine, particularly ayahuasca. So, um, it's a freedom uh, thing. And the difference between doing drugs and doing sacred plant medicine is the heart. Uh, all sacred plant medicine has spirit in it. 
It's not concocted in a laboratory. It grows off the earth. And so it, there's a sacredness to it. And, and the way it's practiced as a spiritual practice sounds like it's so... It's ceremony. It's, yeah, it's ceremony. And so, you know, and now, you know, I, I want you to tell us a little bit about what the free gift that you made for everyone is and so that they can connect with you because really we are here for each other. And anybody who, when you resonate with someone, you will have the option, the opportunity to reach out. And that's true for Nancy too, because she really does do healings and mentorings and all kinds of coolness. So <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your free gift that they're going to get. Well, the gift that I created uh, is, again, I have to say, uh, because I'm not a researcher, uh, I'm not a scientist. I am a spiritual adventurer and a healer. Um, I have studied, I have read books done by many people who are researchers and scientists, three in particular, Greg Braden, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, whose meditations right now are incredibly incredibly well known in the world and the heart math institute who has done it done studying on um the heart's role in creating and um so i have combined some of those things with my own message which my own message came out of uh my illness uh because i didn't trust myself i started saying at the end of every prayer i would say for the highest good of all for the highest good of all, because they didn't want to hurt anybody else. So it's a combination of those things, but what I call it is a creation journey. And it's a guided journey. And I use the rattle, which is the, the shaman's, one of the shaman's many tools. Um, but the vibration of the use of the rattle has a way of taking you into a different place and making change. So you get to create something. Uh, and it's an audio um, and it's something that you can come back and do again and again. Um, and I have my email address in, in there as well, realmccoy.nm at gmail.com. I don't have a website. Uh, it's kind of beyond me <laughs> at this point. You just I'm, don't have it yet, but that's fine. <laughs> because you don't need a website for people to be able to do this deep work. And no. if somebody is moved and wants to be mentored by you or receive a healing by you, they can just email you. Yeah. And you'll, you'll, you, that old fashioned method of like, hi, it's me. Can we connect? Works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and shamanism is based on a number of things. One of them is that our intention is the most important thing. And so my intention is that people can feel the change that they've, they've undergone after they do this journey one time and that they will use it again and again and again. Okay. Um, so that's my intention uh, for people. Yeah. Is is they'll find that they do have the ability to become greater than they've ever been. Because that's what we're here for. We're here to live magic. We are, we are capable beings. We are capable. And we've all been invited. We were invited. We were born. That's our invitation. 100%. And that is so perfect because that is my whole intention with this whole series that is called It's Finally Your Turn, Dare to Be Seen and How to Come Out of Hiding. So please do get, click the link, get Nancy's free gift, do the process and then reach out to her and let her know what happened, especially if you have any questions about it. Um, just ask really don't hide don't stay alone in that place of not knowing okay because we've all been there and we have all learned we don't have to do this alone <laughs> so as we wrap up nancy maybe leave us with the last few inspirational thoughts before we sign off wow um all i can say is that i have found through my journeying inside and out that we are God on this planet. We are all part of God. That means God lives in every one of us. And that we, 
we have been given the most beautiful place to live. Our earth deserves every bit of our love um, that we have. And I just invite you to become more than you thought you could be. And you do that by just taking a little step and then taking another one. And if that one doesn't feel right, you can turn and you can go in a different direction. But keep taking little steps until they become giant leaps and you realize who you really are. Oh, that's beautiful. I think you should make that on an art poster, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so seriously, I mean, you know, that would be just so beautiful. You'll hear it in the interview and you can write down your quote. I had a client once, she would always write down what I said because I wouldn't remember. And like, this is your quote, Devara. So Nancy, that is so profound and simple and heart moving and heartwarming. So yeah, I think that that you should make, make it a, an art project of it. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for listening, for being brave, for joining us, for coming out of hiding. Get Nancy's free gift. Share what you get in what's happening with you in our Facebook group. Nancy, thank you for all that you do. <laughs> and everybody, as I always say in farewell, remember to go out in the world, share your stories, live your purpose, and be a blessing. Bye, folks.